we can move on to the next story, which brings in Sam Bankman's, Bankman Freed's ethics into question. You know, when things start to fall apart, I think everyone starts talking about every aspect of your life, trying to kind of figure out who you were as a person. This story published on Coindesk points to that uh, apartment in the Bahamas that Sam Bankman Freed was very vocal about living in with all of his roommates. Reports are questioning what the dynamics were between the roommates. According to a source who spoke to Coindesk under anonymity, the whole operation was run by a gang of kids. That is a quote. They said that it was a place full of conflicts of interest, nepotism, and lack of oversight. These people also allege that SPF and Alameda CEO Caroline Ellison dated at times. So a lot of allegations in here by staff members of the various companies that Sam Bankman-Fried was involved in. Adam, I'm going to pass this off to you. What do you make from these allegations? I mean, I, I think you said it, you know, like at a time like this, now everyone is trying to, you know, where, where somebody who was really held in high esteem by much of the industry has really seen just a massive, just unprecedented fall from grace. <laughs> uh, you know, like I think that at times like this, people look around and try to explain that. The reality of it is, is that, you know, like when I was in my 20s, I made a lot of dumb decisions. And I think a lot of us did. And so the idea, again, that a lot of the folks who are kind of behind the operations over at FTX and affiliated companies were, in fact, very young, that really means that they didn't have a lot of experience in the real world. You know, and we live in markets today, we live in a world today that's driven largely by mania because the destruction of money that's going on all around us, not a new phenomenon, something that's been going on for literally my entire life. Uh, and, you know, and I think that that's true for, for kind of most people who are involved in these types of markets. And it's certainly true for people like Sam Bankman-Fried uh, and the cohort that he surrounded himself with. So, you know, I, I uh, on the one hand, can really heavily sympathize. And on the other hand, just given the stakes of the game that they were playing, uh, you know, it, it presents, I mean, really, the thing that I question is the investors who backed these types of projects, who backed these types of people, and who now find themselves with a very awkward explanation that they need to make. And this is not just venture capitalists. Again, like the Ontario Teachers Fund, I believe, uh, you know, was in uh, like a pension fund. A number of pension funds were involved, you know, with evaluations, you know, investing in valuations that were in the tens of billions of dollars into these things. That's not intelligent investing. That's FOMOing. That's following sort of like, uh, you know, trying to, to grab for yield. And on the one side, that is the responsibility of the fiduciaries who make those investing decisions. And on the other side, it's the fault of the kind of folks who manage the money out there, right? The central banks, the governments who like create the environment into which we all have to kind of find our ways and into which a company like FTX was able to find an incredibly lucrative business line that powered it for a very long time. Again, if markets had realistic interest rates when they should have over the last 20 years, then this wouldn't have happened. Even something like Bitcoin wouldn't be particularly interesting because if the money that we had wasn't devaluing so fast, you wouldn't need something where the whole advantage of Bitcoin or a money like it is that you don't have to trust anybody to make good decisions, right? Like that's the problem underlying this is, you know, like these are all symptoms of this much larger thing that's going on in our world today. So I don't see that going away. But the particulars of the story I did find to be uh, uh, disturbing. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. Zach? I mean, I like some spicy details as much as the next guy, but I think the thing here is that, you know, everyone loves a winner, right? And when the, at the, when it hits the fan, details like this start to emerge and people who are previously held in high regard as geniuses, as iconoclasts, as those who are bucking the trend and finding new ways to advance the conversation forward are then seen in an entirely different light. And I think the media kind of needs to look at itself in the creation of these heroes that are built up only to be torn down. And I think there needs to be some soul searching around that. Maybe it's part of the human condition. Maybe it's at the root of how we find narratives in this world. But it is remarkable that these sort of archetypes seem to emerge over and over and over again in different contexts as new and novel as cryptocurrency and all sorts of crazy things. But anyway, that's just some big behind the sky thoughts about a story that was uh, otherwise definitely interesting to read. Jen, what do you got? 
Yeah, I Adam, I had much the same thoughts of you when I was reading this. I, I was thinking, you know, why why would we all trust a twenty something year old to to do these grand things that we spoke about so often? And I think that we are all a little bit guilty of propping up these types of people and then and then tearing them down. I I did a lot of reflection over the past week too about my my twenties and you know maybe some of the decisions that I would have made. And it is unfortunate that unfortunate that this person had so much power and the decisions that you know we made in our 20s were definitely had a different impact than the decisions that some of these people um, in these positions make and i think that we need to do a better job at making them aware of that right making these people more aware of the responsibility and the knock-on effect of their decisions and it's just i don't know i i feel so much empathy and sadness for the people who are affected by this. And I I also, I, I know we keep saying Sam Bankman Fried made a lot of really bad business decisions, but I, I feel a lot of empathy for him because I can only hope that he thought he was doing the right thing in the moment and it's all come crashing down. And I don't know how he can carry that on his shoulders. Adam? Yeah, so two things here. Um, so I think that we actually don't know if we made a lot of really bad business decisions or just one that got out of control. The my sense, and again, we do not know this yet. But again, like what what can often happen with these types of situations is that you cheat a little bit to save yourself from some trouble, right? So let's say that again, completely hypothetically, that you know, sister firm Alameda Research had a fifty million dollar hole that they needed to fill. Well, so you transfer over as a temporary loan that fifty million dollars, but that doesn't patch the hole. That fifty million dollars is gone now. Now you've used customer funds and it's gone. So do you admit that, or do you continue to pour customer funds down the hole? And at what point do you realize, hey? I should stop because this isn't working and it's actually going to make the fallout much worse. That's kind of my sense. Again, just intuition here in terms of what may have happened. And that wouldn't necessarily speak to making a lot of bad decisions. That would speak to making one progressive decision that many, many people have made in the past of trying to solve something that seems simple at the time, but actually winding up making the problem much worse. The, the second point that I'd like to make here is just that um, you know, to the point about uh, like, uh, you know, like the, the kind of uh, cult uh, you know, hero type of thing that tends to happen. My sense of that is that this has a lot to do with the fact that this technology is first complex and second, like we don't really know what's going to happen with it. Everything is speculative. So rather than creating our own thesis, it becomes very tempting instead to find people who we identify as very smart, which often is analogized by how much money a person has, and then just to follow that. And so that seems to me, and then of course that gives them more power, that makes it so they have more opportunities to become more wealthy and more important. And eventually, ultimately we find out that everybody is just people and people make mistakes and those mistakes can compound at a very fast rate, especially when you're talking about stuff at the scale at which this particular operation was operating at. So again, like I, you know, uh, I, I basically agree with all the points here. <laughs> it's a complex situation. We're not gonna know everything that's happened. You know, if we do find out that actually like Celsius, they had made a bad decision, you know, years ago uh, and had basically been trying to dig themselves out of it ever since, then that'll be one thing. But I also won't be surprised if this was actually like a, a near-term thing that just got away really, really fast and caused all of the chaos that we're seeing now today. It works until it doesn't. And I think that was something that was said often with the Terra and Luna collapse. And for it to happen with FTX, I think is especially remarkable. It worked until it didn't and it failed rapidly. And now here on this Friday, FTX is in Chapter 11 Bankruptcy Protection. And it's pretty crazy. It's been a crazy week. Crazy week to see this all unfold. Some really great reporting out there by Coindesk and others in the space. Big bravo to them for advancing this story minute by minute, hour by hour, in what has been a wild story to watch. So bravo to the journalists out there. Thanks for getting this information out into the market. And it's always good to see Coindesk leading the charge.